Okay, Katya, I hope this helps. Um, we are going to chat about uses of fluids. So let's go ahead and uh, flow right into this. All right, we'll start with ta by talking buoyancy. The buoyant force is the ability of a fluid to exert an upward force against gravity on an object that is immersed in it. So in other words, we've got gravity pulling down this way, we've got the buoyant force going up this way, working against each other. So the fluid can be a gas or a liquid because um, as we've talked about in class, um, gas actually does behave, behave a lot like a liquid, like that whole like wind tunnel thing, you know, with the, the aerodynamic cars and all that other stuff. Um, the molecules can, in other words, the molecules can be moved. That was a total distraction. All right, I'm back. Um, <laughs> um, all right, so the amount of buoyant force determines whether an object sinks or floats in the liquid. So uh, let's check this out. So if you have less buoyancy than the object's weight, then that means that the object is going to sink because the buoyant force is not great enough to push it up. So it's just going to sink into the fluid. If you've got more buoyancy than the object's weight, that means that it's actually going to sort of float away. Now, if you have equal buoyancy to the object's weight, that means it's going to float sort of like in a stationary position. So you've got an equal amount of gravitational force, um, or buoyant, excuse me, buoyant force up, and an equal amount of gra gravitational force down. So that's, that's where you're going to get that equilibrium, and it's going to float. All right, so let's talk about Archimedes and his principle. And I don't mean school principle. All right, so the Archimedes principle was the buoyant force states that the buoyant force on an object is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. So it depends on density, whether it's going to sink or it's going to flow. So we've all, we've all sort of like, you know, like when you get in the bathtub or something like that, um, when you go in, when you put your body in the tub, the water rises, right? So that is the buoyant force of an object. Um, this states that the buoyant force of the object, that in this case that's you, is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by that object. So the buoyant force would be the water that you displace based on your buoyancy, on your body on your buoyant force. All right, so um, the way to discover the density is to just divide the mass by the volume. So in other words, the ob an object is more dense, <coughs> excuse me, so if an object is more dense than the fluid, um, that means that lots of water is gonna slosh out. So the object is gonna sink all the way to the bottom because there's no way the buoyant force can push it up. In this case, a good example would be lead. So if an object is less dense than the fluid, that means a little bit or no water will slosh out and the object's going to float like a cork. It's not going to displace a whole lot of water. So if the object, again, is the same density, then some water is going to slosh out, but the object, the object is going to float at a constant level. So um, let's keep chatting, ch chatting about Archimedes' principle. So how does a steel ship float since it's solid? It's solid steel. Why doesn't it just sink in the water? Because it's a hollowed out bowl and the shape is filled with air. So basically what that does is it reduces the overall density of the object because it's not all compacted. It's actually sort of spread out and you've got the air that's pushing against the, uh, the water. It's going to displace. So the shape sinks into the water and displaces the water until it equals the weight of the steel and that's why it floats. All right, moving on to Pascal's principle. All right, this states that, that fluid transmits pressure. And not just that, but um, when a force is applied to a confined fluid, now it has to be confined, an increase in pressure in one spot is transmitted equally to all, to all parts of the fluid. As you can see in this picture right here, um, Pascal's principle, you've got downward force, and then you've got force spreading out into the rest, equally into the rest of the fluid. So this is what happens. So what happens to the toothpaste when you squeeze one end of the tube and the other is open? It's going to emerge from the other end because it's not confined by the container. So essentially you've got force in all directions, but since there's nothing containing it at the end, it's going to squirt out. All right, let's go ahead and apply Pascal's principle. Um, this is a hydraulic, using hydraulic machines. So basically what happens is you can, you can turn a small force into a large force because remember the force of, of the force is going to be distributed equally throughout the entire fluid because it's sealed. It's in a sealed system. So you can, you can exert, er, exert this small force down here, and then that force, since you're putting it on a larger surface area, is actually going to become 
a larger force. This allows a small force applied to a small area to be converted to a large force applied to a large area, such as this hydraulic lift. So hydraulic machines use Pascal's principle. A hydraulic system, like I said, multiplies a force by applying the force to a small surface area, and then, since you're that, the increase in pressure is transmitted to another part of confined fluid, pushing on a larger surface area. In this case, the car is going to be raised with just a small amount of force. All right, let's talk Bernoulli. So Bernoulli's principle is if a fluid is moving, it has less pressure than the surrounding static fluid. In other words, around, around the fluid that's not moving. Static is not moving. So the fluid always wants to move toward a low pressure system. So example, this is um, why a window will explode instead of implode during a hurricane or tornado. So as the air, in this, in, in the air as, as the fluid or the air <clears throat> rapidly moves past the window, it has a lower pressure because it's moving than the static air in the house. So in other words, the lower pressure, because the, the air is moving past the window, lower pressure. Higher pressure in the house, the higher pressure wants to move into that area of lower pressure. And if something's in the way, boom, it just blows it out, which is why the window explodes instead of explodes instead of implodes. So the higher pressure fluid on the inside of the window, like I said, wants to move toward the lower pressure on the outside of the window. The result, the pressure moving from higher to lower makes the window explode outward. All right, let's apply this to baseball. So if the pitcher puts a spin on the ball, the air moves faster along the sides of the ball, spinning away, as you can see from the direction of the arrow. Okay, so as it spins away, it's moving, and as it moves the air, it lowers the pressure. So you can see the low pressure area right there. So what happens is that the area of higher pressure wants to move in to the area of lower pressure. So the result is that the overall force, the net force that pushes the ball toward low pressure direction, actually causes the ball to physically curve because you've got that high pressure that really wants to move in to that low pressure. Another example is the weather. Um, if you have a low, pre I'm sure you guys have seen, you all have seen on the weather, watching the Weather Channel or whatever, that um, if you've got a low pressure system, the, the weatherman will say or weather person will say, hey, you know, we've got a low pressure system moving in. Basically what happens is that sort of creates almost, a, it creates a system where the high pressure wants to, mo the high pressure wants to move in to the lower system, into the lower pressure to equalize. Remember, everybody wants a, little, wants a little bit of homeostasis, wants to be equal. So you've got the high pressure moving into the low pressure, and that's what brings the storm. When you've got an area of high pressure, basically what it does is it sort of pushes everything away. And so we're not going to get that weather that's going to be sucked in. All right, let's talk Venturi effect. Basically what's going on here is the fluids move faster when they're forced to flow through a narrow, through a narrow space. So Bernoulli, remember, says that if pressure decreases, the speed of the fluid is going to increase. So the Venturi effect basically says that reduction of pressure is there is, there is a reduction of pressure in narrow spaces. For example, the room between skyscrapers. You walk around downtown Denver and you're going to get that sort of... You walk, you're walking out of the skyscrapers, walk between them, you're going to get that fluid that's moving between. That's because it may not be windy until you put it into a smaller space, then you've got the fluid. And that is about it.